I guess um, sort of question number one would be a little bit around your story. So I think two specific, two big questions, right? So obviously I, I know you teach uh, at the American school here. Uh, you're also an investment guru, you're an author. So how did all of this come about and how did Singapore come about? I know you're Canadian. So it'll be great to get a sense of sort of the big uh, moves in, in your life. Yeah, it's a really good question because I think that the, my interest in money, um, I, I think, excuse me, I think it's a healthy interest because from a really early age, first of all, I met a guy, as I mentioned in my book, who happened to be a millionaire and he was a mechanic. And, and he really inspired me by saying, look, it doesn't matter what you do in life, if you yeah. do something that you're passionate about and you learn to manage money, that's the key because he said, you know, you could make $500,000 a year and if you're spending $501,000, you're really not growing wealthy at all. The moment your job dries up, you're done. So I started investing from a really young age. And two, what I recognized was that I wasn't necessarily going to live until I was poor as anyone. You really have a guarantee yeah. you're going to live until you're 60, 70, 80, 90 plus. Yeah. So any one of us could get hit by a bus tomorrow. And then I recognized that. So when I was about... I was about 31. I I had been teaching. I built up a, a reasonable uh, sized investment portfolio, and and I took a year off, and I traveled, and I, I had a year. And what I had done was I'd actually I budgeted really well. I had started a uh, it was like a deferred salary leave program at my school. Hardly anybody took advantage of this opportunity, but it was a really good one, yeah. whereby you give. 33% of your salary to the school district for okay. three years and then they give you back your full salary in monthly payments uh, in your fourth year and you have your fourth year off and the idea is that you're guaranteed to actually have your um, your job back if you yeah. want yeah and so, so what I did and I think too this is one of the things is that I I'd saved up a lot of money I had a, a fairly substantial amount by the time I was 31 and I also recognized that you know, life is short. I'm going to take this opportunity. I was able to live quite well on just 66% of my salary yeah. and giving 33% to the school district because I was used to that because I was a big saver. Yeah. So st I still continued to save. In fact, I traveled around the world and I still saved and invested a, a fairly significant chunk of what the school district was paying me on a monthly basis. While I was away, I happened to be in Morocco at the time. And I was, uh, I emailed her, was in email contact with uh, an administrator that I'd worked with on Vancouver Island. And he'd got a job at Singapore American School. Yeah. And he said to me, this place is really cool. I think you'd really like Singapore. It's fantastic travel opportunities. And so he said, I think you should apply for a job here. So uh, I flew to Boston and I, I went to a job fair, met the superintendent. And, and I've been here in Singapore ever since. So this is my 10th year here now. Oh, fantastic. I, I guess the next big question is, how do you, so there's, there's two sides, right? So you're a teacher. At, what, do, what do you teach, uh, Andrews? I teach two things, actually. I teach personal finance. Okay. And, and I teach English 9, so English to 14, 15-year-old kids. So, so, so now the next question is, how do you teach investing fundamentals to kids at school? Like, it, it feels so far out from what a normal kid would be doing at school. Yeah, I think there's a trick to it, honestly, and and I and I think I think I found the trick. Okay. Um, I talk to kids about um, first of all, what I do is I show them, I I ask them certain questions, like I ask them, hey, what do you think uh, ten thousand dollars invested in the U.S. stock market would be worth today if it were invested ten years ago? Yeah. What would it be worth if it were invested ten years ago, ten thousand dollars today? Yeah. And I. Show and I show kids how to actually find that answer. I don't give them the answer. Yeah. So I show them the Morningstar website. I give them symbols for, um, say, a Vanguard S&P 500 index, a really nice one. They can look at the chart. And then I show them how to determine what that compounding rate of return is. Mm -hmm. And I'll ask other questions like, so that's interesting. Over the last 15 years, yeah. what would $10,000 be worth if you invested 15 years ago? Yeah. And they figure it out. Yeah. And then, of course, their, their eyes go pretty big. Okay. And you kind of start to get them here. Start okay. to get them. And then I'll say, you know, what if somebody had put $10,000 away in 1978? 
Say well, this would have been say my eighth birthday, and a grandfather put away ten thousand yeah. dollars. What would that be today? And kids find out, you know, it's worth about half a million dollars. Yeah. And of course, their eyes grow huge. Yeah. Like, well, I gotta do this. I gotta do. This. And the moment you got them saying, "I gotta do this," yeah. that's when that's when you got them. Now here's the thing too. Here's where you sort of you make you make a bridge towards something applicable. I'll give you an example of what I did today. Yeah. Yeah, I did something called a, an opportunity cost cir circumstance. And so I say to, the say to the students, every decision that you make has an opportunity cost. Yeah. So if you choose to go to Starbucks three times a week mm -hmm. for a muffin and a drink versus somebody else who chooses to go to Starbucks for a muffin and a coffee maybe once every two weeks, mm -hmm. there's an opportunity cost to going three times a week. And so kids go, okay, well, let's figure out what that cost appears to be on an annual basis. Yeah. So they might come up with something like, wow, you know what? Let's just say it's $10 each time you go. You, know, you put a little tip in the jar, you've got your coffee, you've got your muffin. Let's just say it's 10 bucks each time you go. Well, you find that when you compare the person going three times a week versus the person going once every second week, the difference between the two amounts to something like, I don't remember off the top of my head, I'll say, say, $1,200 a year. Okay. Now they look at that and they go, wow, yeah. that's a lot of money. And then I ask this question. I say, hey, you guys, let's assume that instead of spending $1,200 a year for going three times a week versus once every second week, what if somebody invested that $1,200 a year for 40 years yeah. at the average rate of return that, say, the U.S. stock market has made over the last 30 years? And they'll go, what has it made over the last 30 years? And I'll say, well, you figure that out. Yeah. So they go to the Morning Star, they figure it out, and they come back and they say, you know what? It's about 10% a year. And I said, well, that's correct. Good. Now figure this out. Figure out what that savings would do if that savings went into, let's say, the U.S. stock market for 40 years. Let's say it was $1,200 a year, um, and they earned 10% a year. So they do the math, and then they look at me, and they go, Mr. Allen, this can't be right. What do you mean it can't be right? Well, it says it, it comes up to $600,000. And I say, bingo. That's the actual cost between going to say Starbucks three times a week versus going to Starbucks every second week. And now, then we get to the point where I say, you guys, that's one decision. That is just one, that's one decision. Now what happens if you have a person who every five years buys a new car versus a person who every five years buys a used car for the rest of their life? Let's figure out what this would be. So you have Decision after decision after decision, and I tell right. the kids, I tell the kids, hey, look, and they use the, we got this big long whiteboard, yeah. and I say, look, most of the school teachers here get paid roughly the same amount of money. Yeah. Now, if we were to take school teachers between the ages of say 45 and 50 with two kids, yeah. and and I was to put their names up on the board, all the teachers that you have in school, yeah. and this is a fairly general cross section of society. This would apply at any workplace. Yeah. And I said not put your teacher's names up here on the whiteboard and what their net worth was, yeah. how much money they have. I told them it would range between them having a negative figure, yeah. negative net worth, despite SAS being a really good school, really well paid, yeah. negative net worth to well over a million dollars on the far end. Yeah. Why? And then I asked that question, why? And of course, they now have an answer. Yeah. They go, well, even something as simple as three times a week at Starbucks versus once every second week, even something like that, if that can make a difference of, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. What about these other little decisions that get made, like the five-star holiday versus the three-star holiday over time, flying business class versus flying uh, economy class, yeah. you name taking taxis every day versus taking the MRT. Yeah. I mean, these differences are huge. And so for me, the trick is getting the kids to come to these conclusions on their own. Yeah. So that's where it starts to become powerful for them. Ah, that's brilliant. So the next big one is the most common 
investment advice bandied about is go buy a house, right? So um, uh, one, what you know, I, and, and, and I know you, you've shared a bit of this in the book, but I think there's a bit of local flavor that I'd like to add. One is, how do you think about property as an investment? What do you tell people? Uh, because that seems to be common knowledge. And the second part is the property prices in Singapore, as an example, seem to be way beyond uh, sort of normal levels. Like, would you invest in something like this, or, or would you just stay away? Uh, you know, given the famous Buffett quote that you like, when uh, you know, I think it was I, for, I forgot what it is. When I think the uh, the neighborhood boy gives you investment advice, it's time to stay away, or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, the funny thing about any asset class, whether it's gold or whether it's stocks or whether it's real estate, is the moment everybody thinks it's a really good thing, like you're suggesting here, it isn't. And so, one thing is fascinating, and I'll give you a really great example. Uh, in around 2003, 2004, 2005, when I first came to Singapore, yeah. all, the teachers rush, all the teachers are rushing up to me and they're all wanting to buy real estate yeah. in the United States. And I would say, okay, why do you want to buy it? Yeah. And they say, well, I want to buy it because it keeps going up in price. Yeah. You know, my friend's real estate has just risen 70 or 80 or 100%. Yeah. If I don't get in now, I'm never going to be able to get in. Yeah. So I say, well, that's kind of faulty reasoning, really, if that's your reason, yeah. if that's what you're looking at. But one thing I find that's very interesting is that some of the best real estate in the world right now in terms of price to yield ratios yeah. are, in the, are in the United States. Yeah. Now, how many of my friends are coming up to me and telling me about homes they're buying in the United States right now? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm looking to my American friends and I go, look, look, if you buy a duplex or a triplex in the United States in your hometown and you put, let's say, 10% down as a down payment for the mortgage, yeah. your, your tenants will pay for the mortgage, yeah. the expenses, the upkeep, the maintenance fee, because the yield on those properties is so high, yeah. meaning that the rent received relative to the price of the property is quite substantial. It's not all that hard in the United States currently to get rental yields of 10 to 12 percent per year. Yeah. This is phenomenal. Yeah. This is phenomenal. And I, I think from a business perspective, people need to always think of cash flow. Yeah. Not so much speculation, but cash flow. And every market goes through its thing. I'll yeah. give you an example. Um, when I first came to Singapore, I was actually kind of interested in Singapore uh, real estate. And I yeah. remember mentioning to some Singaporean friends of mine. I said, hey, look, um, it's kind of interesting. That place there, that condominium that's, uh, that's selling for $650,000 and it's 1,700 square feet, that's, that's pretty interesting. Oh, no, they'd say. Oh, no, you don't want to buy that. Oh, why don't I want to buy that? Well, you don't want to buy that because uh, it was worth more than that 13 years ago. Yeah. And if you recall, in Singapore in the late 90s, okay. um, mid to late 90s, real estate really rocked. Okay. I mean, it, it really escalated exponentially. Yeah. And then, of course, the Asian crisis, and then we had real estate coming down significantly. Mm -hmm. And it was so ironic, but it's so much like human nature. Yeah. People want to buy what's recently become more expensive, yeah. but stuck <laughs> stay. They like it. They feel good about buying what has recently become expensive, and, what's, and they don't feel. What's your rule? What's your rule with this? So, so it's like um, I think you mentioned something like if you don't recoup the money in ten years of rentals, then then you're looking at something that's steep, right? Was was that what you worked with as a rule of thumb? I didn't have that as a rule of thumb, but for me, I like to look at what the actual yield is. So what's the return on rent relative to the price? And I compare that with other investments. So that's what Warren Buffett does. When he looks at stock, mm -hmm. he compares it with the yield on a 10-year treasury bond. Okay. When, he looks at the yield of a stock, when he looks at the yield of a stock, he's not looking at the dividend yield. Yeah. He's looking at earnings right, divided by price to get an actual yield on the yeah. stock. So. You know, he's looking at, I don't know, stocks probably yield somewhere in the region of currently about 5%. So, developed world stocks as an earnings business yield. Yeah. Real, estate in Singapore, real estate in Singapore yields about 2%. Mm -hmm. So, it is half as attractive as developed market stocks currently. So, this is an incredibly low yield. Uh, and it's not something that I would actually be interested in buying at all. Would I ever be interested in buying Singapore real estate? Of course. 
but not now. No, no, Every, no. Everything is cyclical. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so the next thing, uh, next big question is indexes, right? So uh, your, your philosophy is, you know, pick three indexes or so, and then, you know, percentages depending on your age, but more or less invest money in, invest in, in indexes. So I, when I was thinking about this, I had a very practical problem. I asked myself, are we in a time when the indexes are too expensive? How do I know if it's expensive? Should I wait for the market to go down? Because obviously it's better to buy them when they're down. And uh, the advice I got from a couple of friends was like, just go and put the money in and then worry about it. I mean, make the money out of the long-term hold and, and essentially don't worry about what the market looks like. Just make it a mathematical exercise. Is that how you would approach it? How would, what would your advice be? Yeah, most, most definitely that's what I would do is to dollar cost average. So investing uh, regular sums into the market. And ideally, for someone your age, you're, you should actually be really happy if the market drops after you start purchasing. Yeah. This is a really hard thing. It's a really hard thing for people to do because you might put in twenty or thirty thousand yeah. dollars, and let's say you put in thirty thousand dollars, and then you find, gosh, it's worth twenty thousand. I should have waited. Wait. Well, speculating is kind of silly because you never know where the markets are going to go. Yes. And and quite frankly, I mean, and two, your viewers might find this kind of interesting. So so I have a portfolio that's is roughly uh, roughly two million U.S. dollars currently. Yeah. yeah. But I'm and I'm 43, and I will continue to work because I really enjoy it. Yeah. Because I'm continuing to work, I'm continuing to add money to the markets. Yes. Do you think uh, Do you think I would prefer to have a rising market or a falling market during the next five years? So, if you were looking to take money out, then rising markets, and I guess if you were looking to put money in, then falling markets, right? Okay. So my question to you is: I'm 43 years old, and I'm probably going to be working for at least another 15 years because I really so enjoy it. Falling. Exactly. Yeah. I, want a, I want a stagnating market or a falling market. And I think you have to remove yourself from what the value of your portfolio actually is as you are, as you're making your purchases. Because if, more than anything else, it's just distracting you. Think about this. When you're investing in the stock market, you're buying real assets. You're buying real companies. Yes. As an aggregate, those companies, as an aggregate, become more valuable over time because yeah. their earnings increase over time. Yeah. The stock market is there to distract you. Yeah. It tells it tells you the popular price of the day, yeah. but it doesn't really give you the true price. So what's beautiful is, if your stock market investments plunge, keep in mind that your investments are actually worth more. Yeah. In truth, in truth, yeah. they're worth more. Because the aggregate value of those businesses that you're buying is increasing, yeah. so if the price drops, this is a good, this is a good thing. You just keep buying. You just okay. keep buying. So that's brilliant. So now the the next one is is going to be interesting. It's going to be what is you what have your biggest learnings been from helping people sort out their financial life? I'm sure people have come to you with financial disasters. To hey, here's a rock star finance guy who could do it with your help. What have been a couple of your biggest learnings been? Well, you know, I'll tell you one of my biggest mistakes in teaching people about money yeah. has learning that not everybody can manage their own money. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example. I could say, I could say to you, okay, it is this easy. Yeah. You buy, a, you buy a Singapore index, you buy a global index. Maybe your bond portion for you becomes your CPF. Yeah. You just, you just buy your Singapore and global index every single year from now until you're ready to retire and and you'll do well. Yeah. That, that in theory is how it works. Yeah. But what I've found, unfortunately, yeah. is when the market rises exponentially, people somehow scramble to find more money or they start taking extra risks with their money. Yeah. When the market drops, no matter what long term studies have suggested they're watching CNBC or they start picking up the Wall Street Journal, they clam onto a reason why this time it's different, markets are going to collapse, yeah. and they sell or they cease to buy. I used to think that you could train everybody to invest. It's so simple, anyone could do it. And then I recognized that a lot of really smart friends of mine, like friends of mine with IQs way above mine, yeah. just on just aren't emotionally wired to invest. Hmm. 
but but yet you don't you don't recommend people go to f- financial services institutions, right? Like because Bill Bernstein says treat every financial services broker like a con man and you'll do just fine. So 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 how do you what's the way out? He's you know he's smart. <laughs> he's exactly right. You've got I hate to say it, but ninety nine point nine percent of those guys are. Uh, yeah, as Bill Bernstein says, they're somewhat crooked. <laughs> and here in Singapore, uh, and in Southeast Asia for that matter, it's far worse than, than Bill could ever dream. Okay. What, Bill see, what Bill sees in the United States is nothing okay. compared to the LAS products that are sold here in Singapore by reps pawning stuff from groups like Friends Provident, yeah. Zurich International, Generali, Aviva, these things are absolutely crooked, but legal. And, and I would suggest that by no circumstances should you go anywhere near those types of products. Yeah. What, what if you do not have the disposition, yeah. and I guess I still have to have hope that, that people can, maybe friends get together and get, look, yeah. just put your money in every month Forget where the markets are going. Yeah. Just do it passionately, and you will be 90% of professional investors. Yeah. If you can't do that, and you can f- hire somebody to invest dispassionately for you with low-cost indexes or ETFs, and yeah. that's the secret. And don't pay them more than 1% per year to do that job. And it's not easy to find somebody that will do that. Um, and in Southeast Asia, I know there's a guy named Tony Noto who is in Shanghai. He does that. He'll manage accounts of ETFs for people. He'll okay. charge 1%. He's actually moving to Hawaii recently and setting up shop there, but he's okay. still going to be dealing with expats anyway. And that's, to me, that's the requirement people would need to sort of, that's the hurdle people would need to be looking for, is not to pay anybody more than 1% and to make sure, make sure they invest passively for you with exchange traded funds and not actively managed funds. And back to the other thing, right back to the other thing, I can't stress how much I want people to avoid the ILAS products from Zurich International Friends Provident and Company. Perfect. So now uh, I'm, I'm getting to the final few, so probably about five to six minutes more. But one, one question would be, what is your advice for young slash new investors? So I mean, I say new because you could have somebody older who wants to begin investing. And what percentages of salary do you think are a healthy start to, to, to invest? What, what do you, you know, it would be great to get your view. I think I think to invest obviously starting as early as possible is great but my advice is that if somebody has if somebody has debts like credit card debt they've got to pay that off first yeah. so investing while you still have credit card debt is categorically insane yeah. because you could be paying 18% on a credit card loan yeah. uh, and at the markets you're probably hoping to generate something like 8 to 10% per yeah. year so yeah. it makes sense so so I would think you know high consumer debt loan pay that off before you actually start to invest so that that would be the first thing. Um, second thing was just to just to invest regular sums and just be really just passionate about it. And when I say regular sums, I think I'm looking at something like uh, I'd say 10 to 15 percent mm-hmm. as a minimum, as a minimum mm-hmm. of of somebody's salary, as a minimum. Mm-hmm. That's brilliant. All right. So uh, over to you. Actually, a bunch of quick personal questions. One would be any favorite books that you recommend or you like or you in general beyond investing oh beyond investing you keep on investing and beyond investing just generally favorite books ah uh, generally favorite. well right now I'm reading a fantastic book called our world's story okay. and uh, a friend of mine my friend of mine named Eric Burnett really 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 bright chap and he's uh, he's written this fantastic book that sort of a world history book okay. and, and I'm reading it now and I'm, I'm really getting a kick out of it Okay. Because it's a it's a kind of history book that you wish you had in school. Yeah, it's, a, it's highly highly entertaining. Okay. So right now I'm really enjoying that. And any all time favorites? All time favorite books? Ah, uh, you know, over and over and over. I hate to admit it, as dry as it seems for so many people, but but I've probably read The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham. I've probably read that crazy thing thirty times. <laughs> Perfect. No, that's- I am embarrassed to admit it, but I love it. Ah, that's brilliant. And and what about any uh, favorite movies or TV shows that keep you going? 
<laughs> favorite movies or TV shows? You know, right now, the one that I absolutely love, TV show, is that American Ninja. American Ninja. Okay, interesting. <laughs> have you have you seen it? No, never, never. Oh, oh, oh you've got to see it. <laughs> it. What it what it is? This obstacle course. And yeah. so what I like to do is I like to, I like to keep really fit. So like today I ran home from from work. It's about yeah. a twelve kilometer uh, twelve yeah. kilometer run. Yeah. I'm usually at the gym one day working out, and then the next day I'll, I'll go for a, like a 10, 12 kilometer run. Yeah. I like to make it hard and intense. Yes. Um, but the show is fantastic. So these guys go through these obstacle courses that take about a minute to get through. Yeah. And the real stuff take about 40 seconds. And I'm telling you, if it's on tonight, I want you to watch it because it is insane what these guys can do. It is incredible. <laughs> that, I love that. I love that. I saw, I saw uh, in the States, I was actually watching one. They have it here in Singapore. I was watching the, uh, actually just last night or the night before. Yeah. But I saw this 47 year old guy rip through this course. And man, I went, oh, I want that to be me. That was awesome. <laughs> Brilliant. So the last couple of questions. One is, you do so much. You're a teacher. You write. You, you maintain a blog. You write articles. What are some productivity hacks that keep you, uh, you know, uh, keep you first amongst the mix, mix of things, keep you productive? What are things you do in a day? <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering about that myself because <laughs> it is hard. It is, it is really hard. You know, finding little bits, uh, bits of bits of time. Like my wife takes longer to to get ready for work than I do. It gives me about gives me about 15 minutes. Yeah. And so I I can sit on my butt and wait for her for 15 minutes, or I can write something for 15 minutes. Yeah. And so as I said, you know, um, if I if I just do four days four days of just actually being productive and having a word document open yeah. and writing for 15 minutes at a time, I'm getting you know about an hour's worth of writing. And, and really it's a lot of time that, that ordinary people would waste. One of the things too that I do is, uh, what I could, like I was saying to you, I like to work out and I like to run. But instead of driving home or taking the bus home and then going for a run, to save time what I do is I run from work. Yeah. So it, it takes me about you know, maybe 50 minutes to run the 12 kilometers. Um, but normally it would take me like you know, on the bus, it might take me 30 minutes. Yeah. So, so uh, for 20 minutes, a 20-minute yeah. time period, I get you know a 12-minute run. Yeah. So there are these little tricks. I think too another thing is you got to be really passionate about what you're doing. You got to be really excited about what you're doing. So then when there are those little opportunities where ah oh, yeah I've got 20 minutes or I've got 40 minutes, I'm actually excited to write an article or to get something down on paper. Fantastic. Final question. And what is it, what is an idea or thought that inspires you that you would like to share? An idea or thought. Well, I think uh, the idea that this going this might sound morbid, but you're going to be dead a long time. Yeah. And just just recognizing that life is short, and at any point it can be snuffed out. And I think to me that's really inspiring, knowing that. You know, every day I live is one day closer to my ultimate demise. And people, people don't recognize that. I don't think they truly live. It says you have to recognize that every single day is special. So if you work your butt off, you know, and you're really not enjoying anything because you're trying to reach some goal or some happy point 10 or 15 years in the future, that's crazy. Because you can end up, as I mentioned before, you can get hit by a bus. Yeah. And, and, and then what? You live this sort of life of misery. And you know, I kind of see that in Singapore with people chasing the five C's a lot. Now, what if I see is cash, condo, car, credit card, country club, whatever. Um, you know, I see a lot of people. I've got this great, we're in a, a great condominium here. There's a great swimming pool. Yeah. And loads of people live in this condominium. Rohan, nobody, I don't see anybody down there. <laughs> where, where are they? Where, where are my little friends around here? They're not down in the pool. They're on their, in their butts off. You know what I mean? you got to have that kind of balance. <laughs> <laughs> that is fantastic, Andrew. So it was so much fun doing this.